So I think this is Brother Renoko Rashidi on the line. Let's bring him on. Hope yes, this is Renoko. Okay. How you doing, brother? Yes, my brother. Mm-hmm. You okay? Yeah, none other. Good evening. Okay. Okay, good. Good evening, brother. Good evening. Okay, good, good. I know you're at... Uh, uh, out of the country, so we appreciate you calling in, brother. Definitely appreciate that. Um, I know you've been very busy, <laughs> as usual. <laughs> so, uh, and I've been I've been reading your articles, man, and and blown away by them, brother. So, hey, we we want to you know thank you for that, and um, definitely keep up the good work. I've posted them a few times on our um, Facebook fan page, the African History Network, man. They've gotten. Uh, tremendous response. I mean, shared, you know, like three, four hundred times, a lot of uh, likes and a lot of uh, responses. So, you know, definitely thanks for that, brother. But um, tonight I wanted to uh, have you to just, you know, talk to us about some of the recent articles you've written for AtlantaBlackStar.com. You have one dealing with uh, invasion, theft, rape, murder, the Aboriginal Holocaust in Tasmania. Uh, another one dealing with the Black Madonnas of Europe. And uh, the last one, I just finished reading that today. I don't want to butcher the brother's name. I'm not – help me with the pronunciation. Joseph – is it Bologna? Joseph <clears> – no, no. <laughs> yeah, you, you did butcher it, brother. It's oh, Joseph no. Bologna. <laughs> Joseph Boulogne, oh. and Joseph Boulogne came to be known in history as the Chevalier de Saint George, or the Saint Georges, and this is an yeah. African who was born in Guadeloupe in the Caribbean on the mm-hmm. um, December twenty fifth, nineteen. I'm sorry, December twenty fifth, seventeen forty five, and he mm-hmm. became one of the great men in um, what's called the Golden Age of French history. And you have a number of people mm-hmm. like that who just stand out. There weren't many of them, but they were brilliant. People like um, Alexander Pushkin in Russia, or yes. people like Adolf Baden in Sweden, and Angelo Solomon in Austria, the Dumas mm-hmm. family in France. There was a man in Germany named Wil- uh, Wilhelm Anton Amo, who graduated with a doctorate in philosophy from the University of Halle, I think, in Germany in 1796. So you have, <clears throat> even during the age of enslavement, you have a handful of Africans and men of African descent. You never find records of African women, but men of African mm. descent who managed to distinguish themselves in a very, I guess what could be called a very hostile environment, or at the very least a very lonely environment. And I, I find yeah. it fascinating. Yeah. Sometimes people ask me, Absolutely. Renoko, why are these things important or why are these people important? Because any African who's able to excel in whatever endeavor in an area where there are very few Africans and there's a hostility, a general hostility towards Africans, it makes for a remarkable story. We find people like um, Septimius Severus, the great mm-hmm. African emperor of Rome, or you find people like um, uh, St. Maurice, the African patron saint of the Holy Roman Germanic Empire. It's just really remarkable things. So uh, thank you for mentioning Joseph Boulogne, and um, I certainly appreciate it, and I think a lot of sisters and brothers appreciate that. Absolutely, absolutely. If you you want to know, or if the audience wants to know, I'm in France right now, and it's uh, Mm -hmm. 3.35 in the morning. So if I sound subdued, <laughs> that's the reason. Oh. <laughs> okay, I thought it was PM there, but yeah, yeah, it is. They they are uh, like about six hours ahead of us, or something like that. Six seven hours ahead. Exactly. Okay, okay, mm-hmm. definitely. Well, we're we're not gonna we're not gonna hold you long, brother. Uh, you know, I, I know what you, you know what you said when you emailed me. So that's we definitely appreciate you coming home, brother. <laughs> and when we do have international listeners, we have listeners in the UK, Japan, things like that. So we definitely appreciate it. But um, your article here, uh, uh, April thirteenth, uh, Joseph, uh, is it Boulogne? Boulogne. 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 Okay. Um, for, first of all, it, it's a fascinating article, and I encourage everybody to read it. But it, it talks about the age of enlightenment in France. Okay, it, and he, it, it, uh, his life is within that period of time, the eighteenth century. What is the age of enlightenment in France? If you don't mind sharing that with us. 
well, I would say the age of enlightenment is due to the exploitation of African and African people. France had mm -hmm. begun to establish itself or reaffirm itself as a, a world colonial power. France is one of the biggest slave trading countries, and they mm -hmm. grew wealthy as a result of that. So there's a tremendous amount of wealth, um, and it leads to what's called a golden age in France. Now, you're looking at it from the perspective of the French, not the perspective of the Africans or the exploited people. But there's a lot of things going on, too, a lot of intellectual ferment. For example, I believe it's 1794 where you have the French Revolution. And the Haitian Revolution is a part of that. You know, so slavery yes. was abolished, you know, in all of the French colonies. And it wasn't, I think, if I have my history correctly, it was um, reinstituted as a result of the rise of Napoleon Bonaparte. So when people mm -hmm. talk about uh, folks like... Um, Robespierre and Marie Antoinette and Alexander Dumas, all of that comes out of this, this period in French history. But the basis of it, I don't think there's any doubt, is the exploitation of enslaved Africans. And this will ultimately lead, or actually it's already in the process of doing it, to the exploitation of Africa itself. So that slavery is abolished, or enslavement is abolished, if you prefer that term. And it becomes more an issue, a direct issue of French colonialism in Africa. Of all the colonial powers, the French grabbed the most of Africa, closely followed by the British. Wow, wow. Um, you know, uh, when I also I think now, correct me if I'm wrong, does it, that period of time, does that also have something to do with um, the... Um, French philosophers and them trying to, an age of, of reason and uh, thought or critical thinking, something like that, does, does that have something also to do with that period of time? Well, the greatest of the French philosophers during that period of time is, and remember, this is all new to me, too. I'm learning the oh, whole process. But the greatest of the French philosophers is Voltaire, and then yes. you're followed by a, a whole other you know, era from the time that... Um, the Chevalier de Saint Georges died, and by the way, the word Chevalier means knight in French. So he became a knight. Mm -hmm. His father was a a French nobleman, and his mother apparently was the most beautiful woman, the mu most beautiful African woman in the island of Mart. I'm um, sorry, not Martinique, Guadeloupe. And mm -hmm. um, so, at a young age, uh, Joseph Boulogne goes to France, and because of his father's status, he receives a superior education. You know, he was able to excel in many, many things. So on the one hand, his race is not a complete impediment, but he was only able to rise so far. Just to, mm -hmm. to get to your question, but add a bit more information, he's also known as uh, uh, the black Mozart. And Mozart yes. actually had to come to him and ask him for a job. You know, Mozart, Joseph Boulogne was the head of the French, I think the French opera, and, and Mozart actually came and asked him for a job. Um, Joseph Boulogne was an associate of Marie Antoinette. He set the, the, um, the trends for fashion. And he's just a, a really remarkable person. So he dies around 1800, 1795, 1794, 1800, and 1795, that period of time. And right after that, you have the Dumas family. You have these, this family mm -hmm. of African-descendant people from Haiti. And, of course, Alexander Dumas is the person who wrote The Three Musketeers and The Count of Monte Cristo and The Man in the Iron Mask. And he is a contemporary of people like Victor Hugo. Victor Hugo right. is the Charles Dickens of France. Victor Hugo wrote um, the book, which was called uh, Notre Dame, which came to be known to history as The Hunchback of Notre Dame. And he also wrote the book Les Miserables where he talks about Jean Valjean, the man who was arrested as a young person for stealing a loaf of bread to feed his family and was given like a 20-year prison sentence, something like that, and who eventually got out of prison and who spent most of the rest of his life trying to uh, duck and dodge from his criminal past. And so there's a discussion about class differences 
as well, between the haves and the have-nots. And he's a contemporary of Emil Zola. And Emil Zola was the person who wrote about a famous trial called the Dreyfus Trial. And so all of these, you know, people were talking about the status, not necessarily of black people per se, but the status of class and the haves and the have-nots. So all of this is a part of this period that Joseph Boulogne is said to have lived. And the lesson, I suppose, um, that comes out of this for me is that all history is interconnected. Just to yes. make a fantastic leap, for example, and something that I'm learning right now and trying to incorporate in my work is the fact that the civil rights movement in the United States, what we call the U.S. Civil Rights Movement beginning in the mid-1950s, and that led to the black power movement in the 1960s, cannot be separated from the African liberation movement in Africa. That Martin Luther King mm -hmm. was a keen observer of the African liberation struggle. That Dr. King went to Africa several times, and so did Coretta Scott King, for that matter. Correct. Dr. King Correct. was in Africa at the time of um, the independence of Ghana. Martin Luther King mm -hmm. went to Jamaica 57. and spoke glowingly at the shrine of Marcus Garvey. And so there was a black power movement in Australia. There was a Garvey movement in Australia. And so I guess what I'm trying to do is, in a sense, with all of this is connect the dots and to show that black history is everybody's history, that you can't separate one from the other, and that all of these phenomena are interconnected. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, I, I don't know if you know Professor Manu Ampem uh, out of California, yeah. man, but, mm -hmm. oh, okay, yeah, because he, he has some, he has, I, I've some, done some interviews with him dealing with the distortion of the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., man. Dr. King is one of the most misunderstood people in history. His legacy has been totally distorted. And um, a lot of people don't know about him studying African history, him being a keen observer of the, the uh, uh, of Africa's liberation movements, things like this, that, that, that's, you know, totally not talked about when, when we talk about Dr. King. Um, uh, also, very quickly here, in, in this article, you also talk about uh, – Cold nowhere, nowhere law of blacks. Um, talk about that a little bit, because when we hear about the French, we hear about Paris, France, and things like this, but we don't hear about them oppressing African people that much. I guess those who really study African history, we know about the French and the colonies, things like this, but in general, you really don't hear about this, uh, about the French. Well, no, I suppose not. You hear stories about people like Josephine Baker, or people like Richard Wright and Langston Hughes, all of them came to France and lived in France. One of Richard Wright's daughters, and of course, for those who don't know Richard Wright, we're talking about the author of books like Black Boy, Native mm -hmm. Son, classical African-American literature, you might say. So right. in many ways, I think a lot of African-Americans, at least, have viewed France and Paris in particular as a haven uh, against white supremacy. And mm -hmm. I suppose for African Americans, that may be true to some extent. You know, I've rarely encountered, uh, you know, overt racism in France. I've been coming here for over 10 years now, and um, I like it here. It's a good experience. Lots of Africans mm -hmm. here, lots of museums, great public transportation, expensive, but beyond that, it's not a bad place. But for Africans from the continent of Africa itself, or Africans who don't have money, Africans who don't have what are, what are generally known as papers, you know, it's a hell on earth. And let me add, too, that each colonial power employed different techniques for dealing with their colonial subjects. And one of the things that the French did was to incorporate a sense of French identity, however false and frivolous that might be. You know, I meet people even now from countries like, Democ not Democratic Republic of Congo, but Congo Brazzaville or French Congo, you know, or, or Gabon or Central African Republic, countries that have been at least on paper independent for 50 years or more, who go around saying, I'm French. You don't mm -hmm. encounter sisters and brothers from Jamaica or Nigeria or Ghana, you know, um, as poor as some of these countries are although the material wealth is, you know, should make them very wealthy. You don't hear these sisters and brothers going around saying, I'm English. But right. the French did a marvelous job 
you know, when I say marvelous, I'm saying that with some degree of sarcasm. I'm applauding my enemy to an extent. They did a, a wonderful job in incorporating a sense of French identity. And so people, in many cases, feel like their loyalty is to France. And then the Dutch mm -hmm. did their own particular job. And the Germans and the Belgians and the Portuguese and the Spanish. For example, the Portuguese developed a group of people called the Assimilados, you know, who were largely the offspring of the Portuguese and Africans and put them in charge. And so the French are, are very similar to that. The French were some of the most effective colonizers, very, very racist, and a lot of us just don't know about that. And that's something that troubles me a great deal. You know, I spend a lot of time on Facebook as well as you know, and one mm -hmm. of the things that strikes me, in fact, I, I should do, I, you know, I've got several other articles coming up uh, soon in the land of Black Star, but okay. I see their format. And one of the, the things that they do is they might say 10, you know, great Africans who they need to make a movie about or the five Africans right. who we need to emulate or five classical civilizations that weren't in Africa but were black, things like that. But one of the right. things, if I ever get the time, I'd like to write is, like, the, what are the greatest myths of Africa? I don't know how I jumped to this point, but one of these myths might be... <laughs> That Africa is not named after a Roman general, or that the right, reason exactly. Africans are scattered around the world is not because of, of Pangea, right. you know things things of that nature. And the other thing is, you know, you I guess stuff, the point man. I was going to make, and I want to say this, and, and then I'll shut up for a moment. I guess I'm sleep deprived. Is um, oh my God, I for, <laughs> it's almost four o'clock in the morning. Um. You were talking about the myths. The, yeah, I was talking about the uh, myths, but there's one myth in particular that I wanted to introduce. I guess it'll come back to me, brother. Sorry about that. Okay, yeah, yeah, but Pangea is a good one. I can email you some things. <laughs> uh, yeah, Africa was named after Syria. Here, here, here we go, here we go, here we go, here go we go. I got it. Maybe the thing <laughs> that frustrates me on Facebook the most is when I make a post and people say, I didn't know that. No, they don't say, I didn't know that. They typically say, they didn't tell me that. Uh, we didn't learn this in school as if it's the responsibility of other people to teach us our history, that we have become so intellectually lazy, let's be real, and so psychologically mm -hmm. dependent that even though many of us say that the European is the enemy of Africa or Africans, that we still expect that enemy to teach us our history. And when you look at that, you realize how slavery, <coughs> excuse me, and colonialism has reduced us psychologically as a group of people. So anyway, I could ramble on and on, you know, about that, mm. but those are some so points right. I wanted to make in attempting to yeah. address your question in some way, form, or fashion. You know, you're right about that. And, and see, what happens is, especially when you go to the college level, you go through college and then you get your degree, you get your bachelor's degree, you get your master's degree, and you don't learn this information. And, and, and you thought that you had a good education. You graduated from Princeton or Notre Dame or Wayne State University. You thought you had a good education, and you didn't learn any of this. And it becomes shocking. You know, let's not just look at high school level. Let's look at college level. Okay, you pay all this money. And, and, and you ain't, you didn't learn any of this stuff. Okay, that can be, become very shocking to people. You know, luckily it was it was in, in college where I started really studying African history. Okay, so I got you know at least some of this information, and I studied on my own. So when I took my first African studies classes, I was talking about things that the professors didn't know about. Kind of shocked the hell out of me. <laughs> but but still, I still learn things from them. But you know, I was dropping stuff on them that they didn't know. So well, uh, I, I think you can't teach what you don't know. And for absolutely. the most part, we don't know what we don't know until we begin to know it. it I sound a little mm -hmm. bit like a philosopher now. No, but you're correct. Very true. And all of this is a yeah. part of the African liberation process. I think Garvey mm -hmm. said it best in terms of freeing your mind 
you know, emancipate yourself from mental slavery. Nobody can free us but ourselves that Bob Marty later picked up on and incorporated into the lyrics of a song. And so yeah. I, I just think, that in a sense, I suppose it's wonderful that in spite of everything that we've gone through, <clears throat> that we're here to have this conversation and talk Absolutely. about these things. And not only, Absolutely. you know, is it um, the other thing, it, it can generate a tremendous amount of anger, you know, and even mm -hmm. hatred. You know, once you begin to realize what has happened to us and you didn't know about it, you know, I remember when I was a university freshman or sophomore and I began to read about lynchings and I was just furious. And if you had asked me what motivated me at that time, I would have said hatred for white people. But fortunately, right. I went through that phase and I was able to channel that energy. And that's another message that I think that we need to give our people. If you're just going to be angry, you know, you're not effective. But if you're able to channel that anger, that excitement, that emotion in a positive direction that will uplift your community, then ultimately it turns out to be a good thing. So people like you and the work that you're doing um, in an unorthodox oh. fashion, putting this information out there, it's invaluable. Oh, thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you. And we appreciate you definitely. Uh, we're going to shift gears here into this other article that you wrote, and then we're, we're going to wrap it up early uh, uh, for you uh, uh, also. Uh, we're, we're going to wrap it up oh, okay. Don't worry about that. Oh, okay. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, Professor Kava Kamene, also known as Booker T. Coleman, I do a show with him every Wednesday night, okay? Um, and uh, he, he, he uh, gave me this quote, and uh, also Dr. David M. Hotep, who wrote The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence, when I had him on about three weeks ago, he, he gave me this quote also. This is from Napoleon Bonaparte. And uh, Napoleon said, uh, quote, my decision to destroy the authority of the blacks in St. Dominique, Dominique or Haiti is not so much based on considerations of <coughs> commerce and money as on the need to block forever the march of the blacks in the world. Are you familiar with that? Yeah, I'm familiar with it. You know, I posted it okay. a few times on Facebook myself. I'd like to find the okay. source of it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Uh, I got to ask Brother Copper where he got it from to, uh, uh, to see. And, and also Dr. David M. Hotel is interesting. They both had that, so I have to see where they got that from. But I find that very interesting. Um, your article, March nineteenth, uh, on AtlantaBlackStar.com, and everybody, please check out the website. They have tremendous information. I've talked to uh, Brother Andre Moore. I think it is with Atlanta Black Star. I'm, I'm going to be doing some things with them also. But this article here, Invasion, Theft, Great Murder, the Aboriginal Holocaust in Tasmania. Um, you know, we don't hear a lot about Tasmania, and we don't hear uh, e even, we hear even less about the Africans in Tasmania. But, but, but tell us, uh, you know, briefly about this. Well, there is a place called Tasmania. <clears throat> it's not mm -hmm. just something that you hear in the cartoons. Tasmania, Tasmania is, a, yeah, is an island off the southeast coast of Australia. Australia mm -hmm. is the largest inhabited continent in the world, permanently inhabited continent. Antarctica would officially qualify, but Antarctica doesn't have a, a history of, of, of human population, mostly the people there who are scientists. The people in Antarctica today are scientists, but... Tasmania is an island about the size of Ireland or West Virginia, and it's been inhabited for at least the last 35,000 years, I suspect, more by black people, who mm -hmm. you can say are the descendants of Africa. Everybody's a descendant of Africa. And that they, um, these short-statured black people, nappy hair, happy to be nappy hair, settled there and lived in what seems to be peace and harmony. I think there are two groups of black folk there. I think one is called the Palawa, P-A-L-L-L-W-A. No, I think it's P-A-L-L-A-W-A. And I think the other group is Pakana. I believe that's the name, P-A-K-A-N-A. -A. And they lived in peace and harmony. They had a very, very basic and rudimentary human technology. For example, they've never found any evidence of farming there, as we know it today, or no evidence of um, fishing or even the domestication of fire. So these sisters and brothers were isolated there, perhaps 10,000, I don't know how many. And then around 1800, the British came 
actually that came in the 17th century. You have a man named, a Dutchman, mm -hmm. named Abel Jansen Tasman. He settled there, or landed there. And that's who um, the island is named after, Abel Jansen Tasman. And after that, it was called Tasmania. And then the French came in the year, friends, the French. And I say that with great sarcasm in the 18th century. Right. And then the real catastrophe came when the British came. And this is around 1800, 1801. And the British took the land. Tasmania was established as a British prison settlement or prison colony. And so the worst, the most horrendous of the British criminals were taken to Tasmania, not the mainland, Australia itself. And they got loose. And they slaughtered those sisters and brothers. And then, you know, a conscious decision was made just to take the land for the British. The British to even deny the humanity of these people. And so most of them, from around 1801 to 1876, were rounded up, killed, and a few remnants uh, were put in a, a what could be called a concentration camp at a place called Oyster Cove, which I visited. And the reason I wanted to write that article in particular, that, you know, I talked to Andre a few months ago, and he asked me to start writing for the Atlanta Black Star, and I was honored to do it. I think it's a great um, publication or a great website. Yes, it is. Um, mm -hmm. a great source is because I wanted to, <clears throat> just as I was mentioning a few minutes ago in my sleep delirium, to help destroy some of the mythology around it so that people have been going around saying all the Tasmanians were wiped out. And I used to say that until I knew better. And then I went to right. Australia and I went to Tasmania and I met them. And they weren't wiped mm -hmm. out. All the full bloods were killed or eventually died but in this process, the British captured uh, Aboriginal Tasmanian women. And I know some people object to the word Aboriginal, so I won't use it. I'll say Indigenous or Black Tasmanians. They captured some of the women and used them as sexual slaves. And children were born from those unions. So that the Aboriginal, um, there I go again, the Indigenous Tasmanians of today are a highly mixed group of people with a lot of problems. You know, their children were taken away from them so that you have issues like uh, big issues, domestic violence, um, mm -hmm. substance abuse. You know, you have the stolen generations. These are the generations of indigenous children who were taken away from their parents and raised as slaves or in a slave-like condition. And these things haunt the sisters and brothers in Tasmania today. So... It was an article that I was really pleased to write. It's really a rehash of articles I've been writing over the last 20 years. And I'm happy to say that that was the first article <clears throat> of mine that was published by the Atlanta Black Star. Right, right. Yeah, it is a fantastic article. I've posted it a few times on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network, and it's, it's gotten, uh, you know, tremendous response, and people just, you know, didn't know uh, really any, any of this history. Uh, in, in my in my page, you know, it's exploded in the past what five months. So I have a uh, like a, I think it's 161,000 followers now. Wow! Um, all of them are not. What did you say? No, I was saying wow. That's very impressive. Oh yeah, actually, thank you, thank you, thank you. All of them are not conscious, so a lot of this information is totally new to them. But it's good that all of them are conscious because we have to get this information beyond just the uh, the choir, you know, <laughs> True. so to speak. <laughs> so to speak. Uh, lastly, you have a fantastic article for March 26th of this year, AtlantaBlackStar.com once again, The Black Madonnas of Europe, Miracle Workers, and Holy Icons. And uh, I know you deal with some of this information in your uh, fantastic book, Black Star, The African Presence in Early Europe. I tell everybody to get this book. I talk about it in some of my presentations. I tell people, you know, it's a fantastic <coughs> book. But, 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 but tell, tell us uh, 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 about this article, because uh, some people still aren't familiar with the, the black Madonnas uh, uh, of Europe at all. Well, sometimes they're called black virgins. But mm -hmm. still, a lot of people just don't know about them. I wanted to write something, um, you know, March is, I, can say, I don't know how it came to be, but it's been designated Women's Month, a Women's History Month. History Month. And so mm -hmm. I, February is our month, you know, officially, Black History Month. So I wanted to write something <clears throat> that would connect 
black history with you know women's history something that I hoped would be uh, considered empowering and inspirational and it's fascinating so what you have are images throughout Europe throughout the world for that matter but most of them are concentrated in Europe several hundred of them of statues or paintings or icons of um, the Virgin Mary and the infant Jesus, but they're painted black. And because they're right. black, it is believed um, that they're able to perform miracles. And you could say that they are the superstars of the cult of Mary. And I've been able to see personally about eight or nine of them. And it's one of the most remarkable phenomenon I've ever experienced. Seeing these black statues with, for the most part, European features is interesting. But seeing mm -hmm. how the local people act around them, the fervor and the degree of adoration, it's really, really, really remarkable. I don't know if there's anything like it comparable in the world. Uh, I've seen them in Russia. That was my first experience in Europe, seeing them. Um, France has the most, particularly in southern France, along the routes that the Crusades were preached and the routes that people, the Crusaders marched to get to Palestine and to, you know, embark upon the voyage to Jerusalem. Italy has quite a few. Um, Spain has some really remarkable ones, including one called La Marinetta that was... Yes. Um, we use the photograph in there. So it's really a remarkable thing. Now, people can say they don't believe in that if they want to. That's fine with me. But when you go into these churches, what you find are um, the prayers of people um, written to the Madonna. And the prayers are for um, from it expressed in gratitude of miracles that are attributed to the black Madonna. People who were crippled were able to walk and they left their their crutches or their braces in the church. Uh, people who were blind and claimed that they could see. Or women who had been unable to conceive and all at once got pregnant. One of the more recent ones that I've seen is in a place called Halle in Belgium, which is right outside Brussels. And this black Madonna, one of the most interesting ones, who is actually depicted breastfeeding the infant Jesus, painted black as a lump of coal, is supposed to, her, her major miracle is that she stopped an invasion of that part of Belgium, and supposedly she thought she caught 33 cannonballs fired by the enemy, the invading army, in the lap of her skirt. Now, you could dismiss that mm -hmm. all you want to, but when you go to the church, they have the cannonballs arrayed around the statue of the Black Madonna. So it's really, really... An interesting phenomenon. So all of these articles are, are written to inform, to inspire, with the belief that very few things are as important in our studies as history. As Malcolm said, of all our studies, it is history that is most qualified to reward our research. So I look forward to writing a number of these articles for the Atlanta Black Star. I've already submitted, submitted articles on um, the black kingdoms of ancient Southeast Asia. I'm looking forward to that. Oh, uh, wow. Vietnam, wow. Cambodia. That ought to be a good one. Great photograph. And I wow. wrote another one on Jay Rogers and another one on Ivan Van Sertima. You know, and there are one or two others. I'd like to do something uh, on the black presence in India, stating mm -hmm. that of all the countries in the world, India has the largest black population. And I'd like to do a piece on the missing noses on the African statues, because that's another thing that I get all the time. Guaranteed, you know, a sure bet, if I post something right now, after I get off the phone with you, a statue from ancient Egypt and the nose is missing, uh -huh. somebody, within a matter of moments, is going to say, they knocked the noses off. Or if you show right. a picture of Hormak the Great Sphinx, people will say right. Napoleon did that. And then I said, right. well, how do you know that? And when you say they knocked the noses off, who are they? You know, right. when did this happen? Why did they do it? What happened to those noses? I don't know. Somebody told me. I heard it on YouTube. Somebody said right. I always believed it was my teaching. And then I get back, and this irritates people. But what is the evidence? 
What is the proof? What is the documentation? And then they get mad at me. They want to stone the messenger. So my brother, to me, it's interesting not only what people think, but how you arrive at these conclusions. Because in many ways, yes. even the so-called African conscious community is no different from any other people. Many people, in many cases, we're like the tea, tea party or the birthers who say, I don't care what you say, I don't care what you, sh what you tell me, Barack Obama is not a U.S. citizen. He was, and in many of us, we're like we're the same way. How do you get this information? I don't know. Yes, I just believe exactly. it. somebody yeah. told me, and that's amazing to me. People yeah. consider themselves hey, sophisticated hey. and intellectually astute, but you know they just repeat the things we've always heard, even though there's no evidence to support it. I, I get the same thing, brother. I get the same thing, man. And I'm like, and see, I, I try to deal with facts and evidence as much as possible, you know. And I had this, I had this uh, uh, conversation with somebody, uh, what two weeks ago, uh, who said that uh, Africa was named after uh, Scipio Africanus, and I broke yeah, I down historically time. and linguistically how that is impossible, and gave sources. And they didn't want to believe me because here's what they said. No disrespect to the elder, but they said that this is what Dr. Ben said. And I said, no disrespect to Dr. Ben, but he he did the best he could do with the limited resources he had. But where is the evidence? We can look at the language because we look at Africanus. Africanus means of Africa or belonging to Africa. I went and bought a Latin English dictionary when I was doing my research on this to find that out. And then we look at the word Africa. I, did, I had Professor James Small on a couple weeks ago. He broke down the word Africa means um, uh, land of the Afri. And the Afri are, you know, North African people in Algeria and Tunisia, black and North African people who are still there today. And then we can look at that Publius um, um, his, Scipio. His family's last name was not Africanus. That was, that was not his surname. He took that after he, he conquered that territory because it was already named that. But we can look at numerous sources, but people don't want to, they don't want, they just want to, they don't want to do that. They just want to believe myths and fairy tales, man. So, uh. <laughs> and, and I can't, I can't figure that out. You know, now, is that yes. the result of slavery? And it just made us, as I pointed out earlier, psychologically dependent and intellectually lazy. Do we need a white person to tell us these things in order for a lot of us to believe it? The people, right. as you know, become argumentative and very, very defensive about these things. And it's mm -hmm. really, in many ways, it's an insult, you know, or yeah. the name al Kabulan. You know, people say that was the original name for the continent of Africa. And I've come mm -hmm. to the conclusion that's very Eurocentric thinking, the idea of continents doesn't seem mm -hmm. to come out of the African experience. What makes you think that people had a name for an entire continent or that people in ancient times even realized that they lived on a continent? You know, where do did, where did these designations come from? And so if you mm -hmm. can't even ask the right question, you will never be able to get an acceptable answer because we're, whether we realize it or not, for the most part, we are looking at things from a Eurocentric perspective. And as a result of that, a lot of the things we study simply don't make sense because we're not looking at it from an African perspective. You have probably done some work, and this is something I should do more work on myself, is in the orientation of the world. That if we go, for example, to Kemet in ancient times, the reference is to Upper Kemet, Lower Kemet, Upper Egypt, Lower Egypt, but up is the south. You know, right. lore is the north, and so in a sense, and Charles Finch told me this way back in the early 1980s, the great Charles Finch, is that we're looking at the world upside down, you yes. know, without realizing it. And we get a little bit of knowledge, and we become very arrogant with it in many cases, and you don't want to hear anything else. It's as though you believe you've arrived, and therefore there's no need to go any further. And I think that we do ourselves an injustice for those of us you know, who have suffered and 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 um, struggled and scrapped for hundreds of years, our ancestors taken out of the door of no return, et cetera, I think they deserve the yeah. truth. One of the scholars that I most admired and still do, who had a big influence on me, was Dr. Chancellor James Williams in his magnificent book, right. Destruction of Black Civilization, where he says, essentially, the African historian must be on a relentless search for truth. It must not tremble with fear, and that truth is contrary to what one would prefer to believe. 
and that's a difficult threshold for a lot of us to cross. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, you know, very briefly here, um, in Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization, Anthony Browder um, dispels a lot of myths, and he shows the correct orientation of uh, Africa because the, the way that it's depicted to us is actually upside down, and Africa is actually much larger in comparison to uh, Europe uh, and other continents than is actually depicted. Okay, so, um, you know, these are things that we, you know, really have to um, understand and, and, and uncover, you know, and, and, and as you say, and I, 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 did, I, I, I um, uh, paraphrase you in, in my presentations, and I, I borrow this from you. I always give you credit for it. Uh, I show a picture of you, introduce a lot of people to you, and uh, I, I've made it my own, but I say what you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you've been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. Okay, so well, this is, I this fully is why agree with that. Obviously. Yes. But that's not from me. I heard I was in Ghana several mm -hmm. years ago, and there was a brilliant brother from Cleveland or in Cleveland named Kwa David Whitaker. Um, mm -hmm. has a law degree and a, um, and a Ph.D., brilliant brother, brilliant brother. And he has a way of speaking, and he was addressing a group of people, particularly young people, and he used that expression, what you do for yourself depends on what you think of yourself, and what you think of yourself depends on what you know of yourself, and what you know of yourself depends on what you have been told. That's really my philosophy of history. But I think, if I Absolutely. recall properly, that those words actually go back to John Henry Clark. And I'm sure that they were not original with Dr. Clark, that what we're doing, <clears throat> I think I can say, is it's not really new. It may take on new dimensions and new directions sometimes. But what we're doing, you mentioned Manu and Michael Imhotep and Tony Browder and, and Brother Kaba and James Small mm -hmm. and so many others, we're just continuing what our ancestors have been doing for a very, very long time, and that is trying to put Africa in a positive light an African history in a positive light and use that information as a motivating force, as a kind of a guideline for what we need to do. Because history, as you know, cannot just be dates and facts and figures and what happened in a certain year. It has to have Absolutely. meaning. It has to have substance. It has to be a road map. And I think, you know, it's a very positive thing that we're doing, and I would like to think the ancestors are pleased by our efforts. Absolutely. Well, I, I hope they are, brother. And I, I know what it's, I know what it's like to do research, man. Because I, I just did a I just did a lecture January twenty fourth. That was the culmination of about four years of research, and it was a hundred slides, and it was about four and a half hour presentation. Man. And I still didn't get all the information in. It was on the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school, understanding that. So I, I okay, I, okay. I, I have an inkling uh, inkling understanding of, you know, of it, and I wanted to make sure that I represented the answers. I wanted to make sure I put together something that honored the ancestors. That was, that was like, one of my biggest concerns, you know, in putting that together. So, um, hey, I understand that. Well, look, brother, I, um, I, you know, you know when, when I originally emailed you and you said it was 3.30, there. I, th I was thinking 3.30 p.m. I didn't realize it was 3.30 a.m. <laughs> no, I don't so, know what I, I was I, thinking I, when I accepted this uh, <laughs> opportunity to be I on your show. I, I, no, 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 it's an honor. You can't turn down an opportunity to talk about African history, and you can't turn down an opportunity to promote the work. And one of the things I'm doing, you know, I spend a lot of time in Europe. My daughter lives right outside mm -hmm. of Paris. I think a lot of people know that. Her mother has mm -hmm. Senegalese roots. One of the interesting things yes. about Europe is that you have the descendants of all the Africans that the Europeans colonized. So that next week, for example, uh, my next lecture is in Berlin. I'm going to address three African German organizations. I'm very excited about that. This is the 130th yes. anniversary of the beginning of the infamous Berlin Conference, where the Europeans, mm. like a mafia family, like the Godfathers, just said, and said, we're going to divide Africa up. No point in us fighting each other. There's enough for everybody. Yes. 
you know, the German, mm -hmm. the French, the, the, the Belgians, the Spanish, the, even the Italians. And so I like it here, and uh, I learned so much here. The museums are here. And so one of the things I'm trying to do is to promote my tours to Europe and promote my tours mm -hmm. in general. So I spend a lot of time here, and I guess I just have to get used to the time difference. I do want to encourage people, if they want information about these tours, the next one is to Morocco and Spain in uh, June, and then the African presence in Mexico, the Olmec heads in July, and then in August I take a group to uh, see some of the great African collections in European museums. If Europeans do anything well, it's steel, or they would say acquire. So we're taking right. a group to Berlin, to Amsterdam, to Paris and to Brussels, that's in August. And then to cap off the year, we take a group to um, Nigeria and Cameroon. And then we start up next year in May, we already have a trip planned for Ethiopia, including Southern Ethiopia in the Omo Valley mm. in Kenya. And so if people are interested in that, and I'll be in Detroit, I believe on the 1st of August, um, Minister Shabazz really? is bringing me back, so I'll get a chance to see you there. But I encourage okay, cool. people to um, email me, call me. Uh, I do check my phone messages even when I'm not in the United States, and to go to my website. If you want to email me, please go to renoco at yahoo.com or renoco at hotmail.com. Renoco at hotmail.com, renoco at yahoo.com, and renoco is R-U-N-O-K-O. -O. Or you can go to my website, uh, which I'm using now, www.travelwithrenoco.com. Or you can even call me uh, at area code 323-920-6055. That's 323-920-6055. So don't feel bad because it's almost 4.30 in the morning. <laughs> I was the one who accepted the invitation. I'm grateful to Andre Moore and uh, Atlanta yes. Black Star. Yeah. You're doing a great job, brother, and you're getting a very oh, positive you. reputation. And you know what the ancestors oh, used to say. A good name is better than gold, and you have a very good name, and you should be proud of that. Oh. I'm proud of it. Oh, oh thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Well, look, brother, you, you know, you, you get some sleep, and uh, people check out. Also on Facebook, tell people how they can follow you on Facebook, because you have a Facebook group where you do the class on Friday nights also, right? You're yeah, doing I do. That, right? In fact, you're in that class. I don't know if you know yes, it or not, yes. but you got a scholarship. Oh. And I'm going to start the class again in um, during the summer. I don't know if it will be June or, or what. I'm looking okay. for the best time. And there will be an eight-week course on the African presence in Asia and the African presence in Europe, four weeks on each. And uh, mm. you did mention my book, African Star, over – I don't know if you mentioned that book, but you mentioned Black Star, the African presence in early Europe. The other right. book, the companion book, is uh, African Star Over Asia, The Black Presence in the East. And so, again, you can go to www.travelwithrenoco.com and see how you can order that book. But, yeah, the class is um, on Friday night. I'm winding down this course. I'm big on Facebook, even though Facebook mm -hmm. it, itself seems to be going through transition. And I don't know yes. what the next big social media is going to be. But uh, you can. I have about five pages. One is the Global African mm -hmm. Presence, which is a fan page, and then it's. Uh, I have a couple pages. Renoko Rashidi, one called Travel with Renoko, another one called Around the World with Renoko. I'm really trying to push that. These global mm -hmm. travels, this global Africa. Okay, we just lost Renoko. Maybe he'll call back in. Um, he is in Paris, France right now, so I don't know if it's a problem with his phone or something like that. Um, but uh, we're wrapping up. We're winding down the uh, interview, and um, I, I didn't realize it was 3.30 in the morning there. I don't know what I was thinking. I just didn't <laughs> realize it was 3.30 in the morning. When he said something about 3.30, I thought he, I thought he said p.m. in the email. So um, 
because because of the time that it was, and I didn't want to hold the brother for the whole hour. That's why we didn't take. Uh, uh, we, we had a look. I think maybe a couple callers, but that's why I didn't take uh, callers. I didn't want to. Uh, I didn't want to do that to him because it's so early in the morning, and he's so gracious uh, enough to share his time with us. But check out these articles, AtlantaBlackStar.com. You know, we, we talk about uh, on this show. Uh, a lot of the articles come from African American uh, websites, African American owned websites. AfricanGlobe.net is another ex excellent website. We talk about NewsOne.com, um, TheRoot.com is is I don't think it's on TheRoot.com is like uh, I think it's owned by the Washington Post. Um, the the editor in chief is Dr. Henry Louis Gates Jr. They they do have. Uh, it's geared towards African Americans. They do have some good articles, but it's more political. It's more democratic, politically oriented. We love Obama, uh, civil rights, social justice, things like this. They do have some good things. They do have some good articles on history. Uh, I read a lot of Dr. Henry Louis Gates' articles. This is how I know what he talks about. They have some good articles on art history. Um, African American history, things like this. They don't deal with a lot of ancient African history, but they do have some good articles there. TheGrio.com is another good source. Now, TheGrio.com is, uh, if I remember correctly, is owned by NBC or MSNBC, one of them. Um, and but uh, Atlanta Black Star is owned by African Americans, as well as YourBlackWorld.com uh, or YourBlackWorld.net. It's on, on by African Americans as well. But Atlanta Black Star, check it out, AtlantaBlackStar.com. They have a lot of uh, good hard-hitting articles. An uh, article they just posted yesterday, Five Traits of Great Black Leaders That You Should Emulate. Um, and uh, Renoko has his three articles there. Um, on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network, we have um, um, some articles that I posted uh, from there, what was another one? Uh, oh, this one right here. 20, 20 black TV shows you watched if you are a 70s or 80s baby. Um, and, of course, they have a uh, different world, different strokes, things like that. Um, they mentioned Martin, but, I, you know, I talked about how Martin was a very ignorant show. Uh, some people didn't like that, but it, it was. It was, a, it was a caricature. And then you have um, uh, Martin Lawrence dressing up like a woman, uh, Shanene, very stereotypical. Um, you know, Tommy didn't have a job. Uh, Cole lived at home with his parents. The mature people were the women. The smartest woman was the light-skinned one. Um, I mean, just... Just you know, total caricatures and a bunch of nonsense. Um, so, but but if you just look at it as entertainment, well, yeah, you you you're going to be entertained. But the problem is that the, those images are exported around the world. They don't just stay in D.C. or Chicago or uh, Detroit. No, they get exported around the world. And and how does this influence our youth? when they see this type of nonsense, you know, bruh man from the fifth floor, you know, all type of nonsense like this. That's, that's, not, that's not funny, all right? Maybe, maybe you have low standards, but that's, you know, somebody who's a critical thinker, 